March 1944. Over northern Germany, the winter haze still hung low, broken only by the drone of thousands of bombers pressing eastward from England. The roar had become a daily torment for civilians and fighter units alike. Yet what alarmed Luftwaffe intelligence was not the bombers. They had faced those for years. But the sleek, silver fighters that now refused to turn back at the Rhine. They stayed with the bomber streams all the way to Berlin, even chasing interceptors home. No single-engine aircraft should have been able to fly that far. Somewhere, Allied engineers had solved the range problem that had defined the entire air war. In early March, a P-51B Mustang, its pilot lost during an escort mission to Bremen. Belly landed almost intact in the fields west of Hamburg. Within hours, the Luftwaffe's technical recovery teams had dismantled the fighter and sent it by rail to Recklinlert's airfield, the secret heart of German flight testing. Here, under the Erprobungsteller Recklin, captured Allied aircraft were methodically dissected. Engineers from Junkers, Messerschmitt, and Daimler-Benz gathered around the strange American machine, its laminar flow wings and bubble canopy already objects of fascination. But the most curious items lay beneath its wings, two dull brown cylinders streaked with grime and punctured by small bullet holes. When a mechanic wrapped one with a wrench, the sound was not metallic. It was soft, like hitting a wooden crate. The shell flexed slightly under pressure. Cutting through the surface with a knife revealed layers of craft paper, glue, and resin-soaked fiber. The Germans were speechless. These were fuel tanks, each capable of holding 108 U.S. gallons, about 409 liters, of aviation gasoline, made from paper, not duralumin, not magnesium alloy, but pressed cellulose hardened with a phenolic coating. Weighing barely 36 kilograms, each tank was less than half the mass of any aluminum equivalent. It could be produced in minutes, discarded after one mission, and built in an ordinary paper mill instead of a precision metal shop. The report from Recklin's chemical laboratory confirmed what seemed impossible. The Americans had created an expendable drop tank designed for one-time use, combining lightweight, fuel resistance, and negligible cost. The resin coating made it waterproof, and the seams were sealed by heat and pressure rather than rivets. When empty, pilots jettisoned them to reduce drag, and the tanks burned harmlessly upon impact, an innovation that doubled as a crude countermeasure against salvage. Within days, the findings reached General Adolf Galland, inspector of fighters. Galland had long argued that Germany's single-engine fighters, confined by short range, could not defend the Reich's industrial heartlands. Now he knew why the Americans could. Each Mustang carried two of these paper drums, supplementing its internal fuel to achieve an operational radius exceeding 1,000 miles, 1,600 kilometers, enough to escort bombers to Berlin and back, combined with the Packard-built Merlin V-1650-7 engine, optimized for high-altitude economy, the Mustang could remain over target zones for nearly an hour before returning west. The Luftwaffe had never fielded anything comparable. Engineers at Recklin prepared diagrams showing how the tanks were mounted to simple aluminum pylons with a single-line fuel feed and explosive release bolt. They admired the elegance of it. No moving parts, no elaborate venting system, only a pressure feed driven by engine suction. Even the filler cap was stamped from thin alloy stock. Everything about the design shouted mass production. This, they concluded, was not a triumph of aerodynamics, but of industry. A paper tank could be built for a few dollars and shipped flat to depots, saving both time and critical materials. Germany, starved for aluminum and synthetic fuel, could never replicate the scale. In one internal memorandum dated March 28, 1944, a Recklin engineer wrote, This tank represents the enemy's true advantage, industrial simplification married to abundance. At the same moment, Allied bomber formations were hammering aircraft factories at Kassel, Augsburg, and Schweinfurt. The Luftwaffe could not replace its losses fast enough while the United States was producing over 570 Mustangs per month. The discovery of the paper drop tank revealed that the Americans were winning not only in the skies, but on the factory floor, the 
Mustang Wreck was reassembled for Limited. Test flights under the supervision of Zircus Rosarius, the special evaluation unit for captured aircraft. Pilots noted its stability, range, and astonishing climb. Fuel calculations confirmed Recklin's estimates. The two external tanks added nearly 800 kilometers of combat radius. For Galland, the realization was sobering. If every American bomber could now count on fighter escort to and from its target, the Reich's defensive strategy was doomed. As spring turned to April, and the Allies prepared for Operation Overlord, Rechlin's scientists understood that the humble paper tank had rewritten the mathematics of the air war. A few layers of cellulose and glue had given the Mustang the wings of endurance and exposed the limits of German engineering genius against the overwhelming logic of American mass production. By April 1944, the skies over Germany had changed beyond recognition. What had once been the Luftwaffe's hunting ground was now a place of fear for its own pilots. Daylight raids that were once unthinkable, Berlin, Leipzig, Regensburg, Schweinfurt, had become almost routine, each one escorted by swarms of silver fighters that seemed to appear out of nowhere. From high above the contrails, they could watch P-51 Mustangs dancing between the bomber boxes, cutting down interceptors long before they reached the formations. German fighter commanders who once relied on numerical coordination now faced a relentless adversary who could follow them home. At the center of this transformation was that seemingly ridiculous invention, the paper drop tank. The Rechlin reports had been accurate. Two tanks of 108 gallons each could extend the Mustang's operational radius to over 1,000 miles, giving it six and a half hours of endurance. What that meant, in strategic terms, was that the Luftwaffe had lost the protection of distance. There was no longer any place deep inside the Reich beyond the reach of Allied fighters. From the Ruhr to Berlin, from Leipzig to Munich, the bomber streams were now flanked by the same Mustangs that had taken off from bases in East Anglia. The Luftwaffe's intelligence service, GLCE2, attempted to counter this by introducing new tactics, high-altitude ambushes, roller attacks, and massed frontal assaults, but it was too late. With paper tanks, the Mustangs could loiter near target zones for long periods, refueling from their internal tanks after dropping the externals. This endurance allowed them to break away from the bomber formations, sweep ahead of them, and hunt interceptors directly at their home bases. German pilots would take off from fields like Wittmundhafen or Gardelegen, only to find Mustangs already circling above. It was the nightmare that Adolf Galland had predicted. Our fighter pilots now fight under permanent escort. From a production standpoint, the simplicity of the paper tank became one of the great unsung victories of Allied logistics. Factories like Cooper Paper Tube Company in Massachusetts and International Paper in New York produced thousands every week. A single tank required only 9 pounds of resin, 28 pounds of paper, and 3 pounds of aluminum fittings. Assembly took less than 15 minutes. They were shipped flat, then expanded and glued on site at airfields. By mid-1944, the United States had produced more than 250,000 paper tanks, enough to supply every Mustang, Thunderbolt, and Lightning operating in Europe and the Pacific. This manufacturing miracle freed up enormous quantities of strategic aluminum, allowing the U.S. to continue producing 574 Mustangs a month, plus B-17s, B-24s, and the new B-29 Superfortress simultaneously. Germany, by contrast, was producing barely 2,000 fighters per month, and even those numbers were illusory. Half were destroyed on the ground during Allied raids. American aluminum output reached 2.5 billion pounds annually, compared to Germany's shrinking reserve of less than 200 million. The Luftwaffe's own engineers could only admire what they could not replicate. In June 1944, at the Recklin Exhibition, the captured P-51 with its paper tanks stood beside Germany's most advanced aircraft, the Messerschmitt Mi 262 jet fighter and the Arado R 234 jet bomber. Visitors included Galland, Field Marshal Erhard Milk, and even Reichsmarshal Hermann Göring. The symbolism was unmistakable. 
On one side, revolutionary machines that Germany could scarcely fuel or maintain. On the other, an American fighter whose brilliance lay in its practicality. A handful of Mi-262s might outrun a Mustang, but they could never be built or supplied in sufficient numbers. The German technical officers took note of the craftsmanship. The paper tanks were not crude improvisations, but perfectly engineered consumables, precisely dimensioned, fuel-proofed, and even fitted with venting holes to prevent collapse during descent. A Recklin engineer summed it up bitterly in his report, We built for eternity. The enemy builds for today, and therefore wins tomorrow. By the summer of 1944, this insight had turned into catastrophe. Luftwaffe fighter losses exceeded 350 aircraft per month, and training schools were forced to send barely qualified pilots into combat. Every new recruit faced swarms of Mustangs overhead. The paper tank, by enabling these escorts, ensured that even the most distant synthetic fuel plants, Luna, Brooks, Politz, could be bombed repeatedly, strangling Germany's ability to make aviation fuel. Without gasoline, even the Luftwaffe's advanced jets became useless museum pieces. In the months that followed, the Americans expanded the concept to the Pacific, fitting P-51D Mustangs and P-47Ns with larger 150-gallon paper tanks for long-range missions over Japan. The idea, born in the paper mills of New England, would eventually help carry fighters over Tokyo in 1945, proving that disposable simplicity could achieve what technological extravagance could not. Back in Germany, as Allied armies closed in, the Recklin scientists preserved their analysis reports, some later recovered by U.S. intelligence teams after the war. In those faded documents lies the quiet confession of a defeated Air Force, that the war for the skies was not lost in combat but in logistics and imagination. The paper drop tank, a lightweight, perishable, almost laughably simple invention, had outlasted every steel and aluminum creation the Reich could muster. When historians later reviewed the Luftwaffe's technical correspondence, one phrase recurred again and again. The enemy's strength is his ability to make even waste serve the purpose of war. It was a fitting epitaph. The humble paper tank had done more than extend the Mustang's range, it had extended the reach of industrial warfare itself, proving that victory in the modern age would belong not to those who built the most advanced machines, but to those who could build the most of them.